explain why kind of so cool. Uh, my name is uh, Lego KTM or uh, Knoll. Um, I'm here to talk about 10 years of Tool Forge. So uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been Wikipedian since 2006. Um, I was user number two. <laughs> <laughs> it was 10 minutes late. Oh, oh, um, and I'm a media key developer, system administrator. Um, I used to be um, WMF staff. I'm a volunteer again. Um, I, for about one month, I was paid to work on um, Tool Forge and other products, but otherwise, I've worked on other areas. And just Tool Forge is, you know, kind of a, a thing that I've really been involved with um, throughout this time. Um, and this is proof that I was user number two. Um, if you look, you can see that AdShore was, was number one because he made a request 10 minutes before I did. And then I was like, oh, I want that too. And there it is in Wiki history forever. It looks like user number five. Okay, so the <laughs> don't count. Um, and um, so just like a quick show of hands, how many people know what ToolForge is? Well, I use it. I don't necessarily know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I probably won't spend as long. I'll skip through the slides that explain what Tool Forge is. Um, but I kind of want to go like before we get to Tool Forge, what is a tool? And uh, I feel that some people can have a narrow definition of oh, if it's on Tool Forge and it's a web tool, then it's a tool. But tools are a much broader concept. Like it's really any bit of software that makes editors' lives better or does something you know, to help the projects, um, or even just expose data. Um, it could be a web interface, it could be a bot, it could be a gadget, it could be some combination of them or something that does something else entirely. Um, it's really written by someone in the language of their choice. Um, they might not even be the person who wrote it, they might have adopted it from someone else and are just keeping it alive. Um, and some are like well maintained, and there's like a group of people who are actively looking at it. Will like you can immediately reach out to them for feedback, and some just like coast along, and they will just survive for the next ten years because you know they're very simple and and nothing tends to break them. But it is that no one is actively watching it; it is just existing. Um, and so as an example of, of tools, this is, um, you know, like Earwig's copy bio detector, um, which is, you know, on the tool, on tool forage, you know, bots will say this bot runs on, on tool forage. Um, I have a bunch of other examples of tools, um, like wiki shoot me, um, is Magnus's tool that allows you to like find, uh, based on where you are, find articles that need pictures, citation hunt you know, exposes like citation needed tags and makes it in a much easier way to add citations. Um, uh, the ISA tool like is, lets you add information to comments, images, like uh, structured metadata. Um, view it is um, like you enter in the Wikidata item and it shows you a bunch of pictures or like images related to it. Um, and my favorite is, well, one of my favorites is crop tool which you just give it the comments URL and then it lets you like nicely crop and rotate images from your browser. Um, and like all of these are, are tools that are all like in very different ways. Some expose information, some let you make edits and, and um, some like facilitate collaboration. Um, so what is ToolForge? Um, ToolForge is a hosting platform for Wikimedians. Um, it's a place where you can run your bot or host your tool. Um, it's a free service for users that is, you know, paid for by the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and it's an open source service that like all, just about as much code as possible is fully open source that you can just look up online and, and send patches to. Um, um, as of last night, um, there are uh, 3,300 um, hosted tools on ToolForge and 2,500 individual tool maintainers. Some tools are like incredibly complex and actually have five different tools hosted within them. And some tools someone created and then never finished. And so it is just a, it's just a record in, in the database that says there's a tool there. So I, I think it's a, it's probably a reasonable number. Um, 
Um, so yeah, we're here to talk about 10 years of Tool Forge. So just like a, a rough timeline, um, Tool Forge is, is really the second incarnation of, of the project of like a hosting service for comedians. The first one was the Tool Server. Um, it started in 2005 and there was a donation by Sun Microsystems of servers to, to Wikimedia Germany um, that were like, okay, now that we have servers, well, what do we do with that? Um, and, and turn it into this project. Um, 2008 is when I feel like Tool Server really was like, okay, like this is a real thing. Like we should give it its own domain name. It is no longer just like a, a project of Wikimedia Germany. It was like, a, it's a big thing. Um, in 2012 was like the first time that like people started discussing like what is the future of the tool server um and there's this like massive mailing list thread with like 70 80 posts just titled like future of tool server um in which people discuss like the tool server um and its current issues the foundation not wanting to fully support it um and what what the future is, and there's this like nebulous concept called Wikilabs that was discussed at the time. Um, it would not be called Wikilabs, but in 2013, um, there was a project called Tool Labs started, um, and that's uh, and very quickly right after that, less than a year, like a year later, was when Tool Server shut down, and there's this migration process. Um, and then in 2017, um, people realized that. The lab's wording made it seem like an experimental service and not like an actual usable platform and rebranded to Tool Forge. Yeah. And 2024, it's we're all here in this room um, discussing this. Um, and somehow it has been 10 years. Um, so what was the tool server? So, like quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of the tool server or used it or or around? Okay. So um, the tool server um, was, like I said, operated by Wikimedia Germany. Um, but even though the servers were operated by Wikimedia Germany, they were sitting in the Wikimedia Foundation data center in Amsterdam. Um, and it was mostly run by volunteers up until like the very end when they paid for like a, a, a staff person to help with the migration off of it. Um, and it really had the same-ish goals of allowing users to host web tools and bots. Um, but the killer feature was really that it had database replication. Um, and so MediaWiki, you know, like all of the page, like most of the information is stored in the wiki text of the page. But there's also um, a MySQL database that backs it up. And so like, this is like, not even like one tenth of a screenshot of the MediaWiki database. This is like what was readable that I could fit onto a slide. Um, but like, you know, you have the user table, you have information about all different users, about what preferences they've set, what um, what uh, permissions, what permissions they have, whether the pages have, and then like on the page side, you know, there's whether pages are protected, um, whether users have blocks and, and so forth. And all this information is stored in a database. And historically, um, you could actually, like, MediaWiki had this form that was called Special Ask SQL. And you could just go to the wiki and just type in an SQL query, and it would give you the answer. Um, and, and if you're familiar with web security, you'll be like, wow, this is a terrible idea. Um, and, and it kind of was, uh, and, it, and, they, and they got rid of it. Um, but as kind of as a, as a replacement for this was they worked on setting up a replicated um, a version of the database that had all the private information redacted. Like if you look, you'll see like user password is listed there. Um, and that is not a thing you want exposed to people. Um, and uh, with all the private information redacted and then people could just run arbitrary queries. Um, and this like really unlocked a new level of, of um, tool building um, really. Um, and that like people could, instead of having to like you know, parse wiki text to figure out what templates are, you could just query the templates table um, and, and get a list. Um, and if you use Quarry, like Quarry is all just running on, on replicated databases. Um, okay, so physically, what was the tool server? Um, that is from what I believe is like one of the, the first servers donated by Sun. And then you can see it on the right side, like that's in the racks in, in Amsterdam. Um, um, this is the, the first wiki page that I could find about like about tool server on, on MetaWiki. Um, and you can see like this is I think before it even 
like actually exists or like was set up and everything. This is like, oh, this is the concept that we want to do. Um, and the, the one thing I want to highlight is that like if, if you look at the bottom where it says list of people to invite, you can see that there's like five different like tools listed there and they're all on like different people's individual domains or one one of them looks like an academic institution, you know, and it's just like it's very scattered, right? Um, and if, if you go through the page history, you'll see that like people just started adding more and more tools. Um, and part and part of it was that like all this is very scattered. It's relying on different people's um, you know either goodwill or paying out of out of their pocket for a server hosting and stuff. Um, and the tool server was like, okay, we can we can kind of bring these people together in in one area and provide hosting for them. Um, but you know, as I kind of mentioned, you know, the tool server shut down, um, and so I think it's you know what what went wrong with it. Um, I would say that it was a victim of its own success. You know, it was it was incredibly successful in that it gathered a lot of tools in one place, um, which was something that you know hadn't been done before, um, and it really proved the concept that we comedians would use the resources. Like, if you give, say, like here, I have a server, let us, you can have access to it. People will use it, you know, and they will build stuff to it. And towards the end, it was basically that like it's running on donated hardware. The hardware isn't enough. People made some uh, questionable technical decisions, and it was it was it was just failing and couldn't keep up with the load. And if you like look through the archives of the tool server mailing list, it's people saying like the database is corrupt. Please re-import it, you know. And like oh, like the web server has crashed. Can someone restart it? And then you know there will be a comment being like, why does the status page say that everything is still up to date? And it's you know so our, our status page says everything is up. Like counts expires but, every six months, and you have to have someone renew it for you. Yes, there 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 there, there were you know issues, um, and it it got bad enough to the end that like um, when people were discussing the transition, that um, we came to Germany ended up paying someone to like manage it for the last year ish and like actually make sure that we had you know enough up time that people could get their stuff out. Um, and I would also say that it was in this like weird gap where like it was both Wikimedia Germany's responsibility, but also the Wikimedia Foundation's responsibility and like um, the whole like replication process of the database, like which was like a big, a big feature was like it was the Wikimedia Foundation has the main databases that flow into this redaction program that was actually like genuinely called train. That was the name of the program that did <laughs> replication. Um, and uh, it would um, then flow into, you know, the tool server where Wikimedia Germany, like volunteers would be maintaining it. And if it broke anywhere in the pipeline, the whole thing had to be restarted from scratch, you know? Um, so um, let's let's talk about um, ToolForge. Um, so like I, like I mentioned at the timeline, School Forge was like on a very tight schedule, right? Like 2012, people know that the people start get the first inclination that Tool Server is going to be shut down. 2013, you know, Tool Forge comes online, and 2014, Tool Server is shut down. For a project that's existed for like eight years at that point, you know, having like a one year shutdown was a was a very quick thing. And I think the big thing was also that like Tool Server had built up a lot of like institutional knowledge. They figured out things, and you know the Wikimedia Foundation made the decision to like kind of start from scratch on it, um, and that led to like it was a bumpy ride to to begin with. Um, and like the biggest issue was um, in October there was a data security issue where like the replicated databases didn't actually redact some of the private data, specifically people's password hashes and email addresses. Um, and it, you know, like it was, and it had been doing that for about eight months at that point, or eight to 10 months at that point. Um, and, you know, like people went back, looked through the queries and it doesn't seem like anyone did anything malicious, but it was just like, okay, like we're not getting off to a good start, you know? Um, but I think after that, um, Things things have have generally gone up. Um, so some of the differences, some of the like key differences in, in my opinion between that ToolForge changed from ToolServer was first of all was um, shared ownership of tools. So in ToolServer, it was kind of like standard Unix hosting where you get an account and you get web space, but it is your space and your account. And if you do something, it's it's only you can touch it. And if someone else wants to like modify it, they have to ask permission and you have to do it. You know, you can't actually share resources. 
Um, Tool Server technically had this thing called multi-maintainer projects and it was used by like four people. Um, it, it really never caught on. Um, whereas ToolForge from the very beginning was a tool is a specific account that is owned by multiple people and you have to like log in as the tool to do stuff, but you can add multiple people to a tool. And that was like from, from the very beginning. Um, it had to be open source. Um, ToolForge required all code and tools. Anything that ran there has to be open source. Um, ToolServer had, um, ToolServer did not have a rule like this. They allowed people to run proprietary code and there are people who like use their employer's time to write code that was proprietary. And then um, when it stopped working, it just stopped working and there was no code and no one could do anything about it. Um, and Brian gave a great talk eight years ago now at, at wiki conference basically discussing this problem where someone has done this thing and then no one is able to like actually keep the bot alive because you don't even have the legal rights to do so um and uh the last thing is that um tool forge is, is run by like a collaboration of paid staff and volunteers um and at the very you know from the very beginning um there's there was um the found community foundation was assigned paid staff work on the project, but like just like very close to the beginning as well, like there were volunteers with like full root admin access um, that made so that like it was not a fully Wikimedia Foundation controlled project. And it also wasn't like, oh, this is fully dependent on the goodwill of volunteers. It was it was genuinely a collaboration uh, between both. And, you know, that leads to tension at some times, but I think it has, has worked out um, incredibly well. Um, and so, yeah, like I mentioned mentioned earlier about like the single owner of tools versus multi-maintainer projects, um, you know, like it's very clear just from the URL structure, like tool server tools were toolserver.org slash tilde username slash and then whatever tool tool it was. And so it was like just in your user's personal space, um, whereas on ToolForge, it's, you know, tool.toolforge.org. And if the project switches hands, if more people get added, you know, the URL doesn't change. Um, you don't break stuff. You can just keep, you know, you can adopt the existing project. Um, so what what ToolForge got right? Um, the technical architecture is is better. Um, and I'm like biased in this because I have had a hand in the technical architecture. Um, but like I said, like the tool server was like running a mix of like Linux, Solaris. Um, it was running a non-standard like HTTP server that one person used and like fundamentally tool server was a volunteer project. And so it is up to the whims of volunteers. And if volunteers want to run a weird operating system power to them, right? Like the only problem is, is that it also forced everyone else to deal with it. Um, and, and really, uh, really ended up causing problems because there was literally like one person who understood and liked Slar and the rest of us were forced to deal with it. Um, I think paid staff really does make a difference. Um, I I think that, you know, there are a lot of times where Wikipedians um, feel resentment that paid staff are, are doing something and people are getting paid to do what people are doing also for free. Um, and also that it creates an unequal balance um, in that paid staff have more power over volunteers. Um, I don't, I think that those inequalities still exist, but I think that compared to a lot of projects, I think ToolForge really tries to handle that balance correctly. Um, and like, really like, when I talked about database replication earlier, like there would be times where like the database would be out of date for like three months. Like, can you imagine like just all of the bots and tools not working because it's running on three month old data? Like the wiki changes every second. It, it, it is fundamentally useless and, and, realist, and really like, there are entire class of tools that like exist today that could not have existed back then just because the service was so unreliable. Um, um, continuing the what what got right, um, multi maintainer projects are awesome. I think the best analogy to like understand how like warp the tool tool server mindset was like imagine you create a page on Wikipedia and then you leave. And then the page just gets deleted because you've left, even though other people like want to contribute to it. Like that would be, you know, crazy. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. Um, and I think similarly, like the whole multi-maintainer project idea that projects stay, like they are not tied to an individual user. Um, 
And and um, one one cool feature that is still underused is that you can set up just common groups of maintainers, and you can just have um, you can just have like these are my friends and people I trust, and they will be maintainers of all of our tools, and you can just make it you know all linked together. And so like there are two or three people where we kind of have an informal thing where I add them to maintainers of my tools, and they add me as maintainers of their tools, and when something goes wrong, you know, one of us can take a look at it, even if the other person is busy. And that way, it, you know, shares responsibility and, and helps, you know, increase sustainability. Um, and then finally, like we talked about um, the proprietary stuff, um, Toolforge really set up the conditions for succession. Um, and I would say, like, I, I think it's still like a, a setup thing in that, like, it is not yet straightforward to take over a tool, but it is possible. And I think that is like still, you know, a big step forward from what it was previously. And it's been done for people who are like willing to go through the process. And I think, you know, over time the process will get better, but like, it's still, it's still very much like a, at least like it is a tech, it is a thing that is like actually possible to do you know, compared to previous. Um, and then like one of the things that, uh, I think that Toolforge does like way better than every other technical project in the Wikimedia world is that they do an annual survey of all of their users. And I think that is incredible because if you like at the end of this talk ask like, well, so is Toolforge better than Toolserver? You know, we can definitively say, well, we have all of this data that says like, yes, people actually like it better. Um, and I think that is like incredibly valuable and can justify and e even retroactively is incredibly useful to look at. Um, and you can see like 2015, um, this is the most recent one is 2022. Um, and like, you know, I think the 2023 data will eventually come. And, uh, you know, at the end of the year, there'll be 2024. Um, but, um, you know, like, I think this is from the 26, I think uh, it was around the 2016 survey was like the last time, like they asked like, were you a previous user of the tool server or not? Because now it's like 90%, it's like 80% of people have not used the tool server and it kind of became less useful to ask the question. But if you look like the question is, how do you compare the support you received when using tool server with the support you, you receive when using tool forage? Um, and if you look over there, you can see that like the top, top line is, is better. Um, and then the middle one is as good. And if you look at like people who, you know, spend two to eight hours a week developing tools, 61% of people think it's better and 38% think it's as good and 0% think it's worse. Like, I think that's a, a pretty great accomplishment. Um, so Toolforge um, is kind of like, is one sub project of cloud services. Um, and Wikimedia Cloud Services is like provides, you know, cloud hosting based effectively for um, for Wikimedians. Um, and like if you're familiar with like AWS or Google Cloud, it's it's conceptually similar to that, um, but it has a much cooler logo. Um, and uh, I think importantly, like the reason I bring up Cloud Services is because it is like a full blown Wikimedia project. Um, which I don't think people realize that if you go to like wikimedia.org, you'll see this like very nice, you know, gallery of logos of all the projects we work on. And then at the very bottom, you'll see Wikimedia Cloud Services, which is there. Um, and what does it mean to be a Wikimedia project? You know, I think like when people look at Cloud Services, Toolforge, and when you look at even projects like MediaWiki, um, you'll be like, oh, this is just a support thing. Like, this is what we need for Wikipedia. It is not its own project, right? It is just here to assist the other ones. Um, but I think it is a Wikimedia, it is rightfully a Wikimedia project in its own right. Um, you know, like all the stuff on, on Toolforge, it really enables editors to better contribute to, to free knowledge. Um, and it, um, it as well is like contributing it. Sorry, how am I trying to say this? It, 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 um, in addition to like helping people contribute to free knowledge, it is also spreading free knowledge. Like you will find tools that, um, you know, just are just exposing, you know, Wikipedia data in, in a new way or like collecting collecting things together in like a novel way that is like, that is that is different. Um, and I think it is similar to like the Wikipedia MediaWiki relationship where like, yes, Wikipedia, like MediaWiki is built for Wikipedia and Wikipedia is obviously like the first class user and does a really great job showcasing it. But MediaWiki on its own is used to build wikis that are also spreading free knowledge, but also, but don't, you know, necessarily fit 
in the in in Wikipedia, and there's plenty of content that goes along with that. Um, so I um I've kind of talked about governance a little bit, um, and you know about the relationship between WMF paid staff and along with volunteers. Um, and you know I think it, I would say that it works well having been on both sides of of the equation. Um. And I would say, like, you know, I, I don't want to say that it's perfect or anything like that. Um, I think there is there is tension and that's fine and, and probably good. Um, but I think it's very accessible. I think that like the fact that you can just pop into an IRC channel and ping people who are, you know, staff and like, yeah, they might not offer they might not respond when it's like midnight or whatever. But it, generally, you will get a response within like 24 hours. Um, you know, I think that's I think that's great. I think like. Sometimes it feels that like when you file like a bug task, it is just going like a fabricator task. It just goes into the ether. When I file tool forge tasks, I don't feel like that because I know like who's going to end up looking at it and triaging it. And like that doesn't necessarily mean that like it will get done like right away. I just know that it's not like it hasn't like vanished into a bottomless pit. Like it is, it is there and will will be considered. Um, and like um, for the most part, like the the um, cloud services team and, and the tool forge okay. stuff, like there's an open IRC channel where like all of the administration stuff is discussed and like it's like publicly linked and, and discussed, you know, it's like with media cloud dash admin. And, you know, like if you are like, are interested in following along, you can do that. Like there's no special private secret, you know, cabal type thing. Um, and then like, um, like most of the like um, tool forge administrators who are volunteers as well as staff, um, you participate in monthly meetings and like uh, I'm not able to make all of the meetings, unfortunately, but like the notes are on the wiki, like for everyone to read. And even if like you are not attending, you can still contribute and participate. And you can also just ask for an invite too. Um, it's, it's it's really not that big of a deal. Where do you find the record of the past public meetings? Um, I did not include a link, which is my bad, but uh, I can... on Wikitech. Yeah, they're they're on Wikitech, and I can show you the link afterwards. Okay. Um, so I think like you know, I, I, my my take is that Tool Server really like pioneered the idea of like let us just give Wikimedians server hosting, and it gathered all of the tool users in one place, and I think it was successful at that specific thing. I think. Then you can look at it that Toolforge took that idea from like a volunteer driven like thing that works but could be much better into okay, like let's take this and professionalize it and make it a very sustainable thing um, that people can like genuinely rely on and not worry about constantly going down. Um, and I think I think that has like mostly been accomplished, you know, like this there's, there's always improvements to do, but like for the most part, I, I would say like that is is done. Um, so I, I think there's like a big question of like, well, what is next? You know, like the tool server lasted eight years, tool forge has been 10 years. And so now we should delete it all and start something new. Um, no, Absolutely. I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not serious about that, but, um, like, I think there's like new sets of problems that because tool for tool server and tool forge have been successful that like we have expanded into new sets of problems. And so like the first and biggest one is that we don't have a comprehensive, complete list of tools. And there are various attempts at doing this um, and they are not complete, which is fine. Like, I think it is it is just a thing that like, it is a work in progress and, and it will just require more people to work on. Um, and like Tool Hub is, is kind of the best thing we've got right now, um, but it, it still leaves to be desired. And, and like, it's a common thing where like I go to like, um, Wikipedia meetups and I'm like, oh, like, well, you can just use this tool to do this. And they're like, okay, mind blown. Like I had no idea this existed. And, and that's just the thing that like people don't know yeah. things exist. And like we talked earlier that we have like 3,300 tools, like no one even knows what all of them are. Like there's, there's just too many. Um, then, um, user awareness. Um, I think this audience may be a little self-selected, but like my experience has been with working with people is that like they rely on Toolforge every day and they don't know it. And like users like genuinely like will visit URLs that are like tool.toolforge.org and still not understand they are on a separate project that is run by this like whole group of people. Um, and as a result, I think that users don't know who to complain to when something doesn't work. 
Um, and so like, you know, on the, the English Wikipedia, for example, has like a village pump technical page. And like, some people will like complain there about like my own tool. And like, it very like says, like this was, you know, created by me or like it's a link to report bugs, but they, they default to their place of like, this is where I report technical issues. And then like, you know, a few hours later, someone who like understands like, oh, like, let me just ping Lego, like, he, he can fix it. I'm like, well, why won't you just tell me directly? Like, I've given you all these instructions to do it, but no. Um, and, and, you know, the cool area about that is like, because users don't understand where it is or like the basis behind it, they can't self-diagnose or remediate their own issues. And like, sometimes it's, it's very simple that like, oh, like someone just needs to restart the tool or, or it's like a little more complicated, like, oh, there's like a wiki page that controls it that needs to be updated or something. But it's like, because users don't understand how it works, they can't help themselves. Um, and I would say that um, Toolforge is not very wiki in like the wiki way sense of doing things. Um, you know, to maintain a tool, you have to be given permission. Um, some of the changes to tools like, you know, are not really tracked anywhere. Like if you create a new page on Wikipedia, there's like a log entry that says a new page was created. If you create a new tool, there is no like log that says like, oh, I want to see what new tools people are creating. You know, there's, there's not really an easy way to find that. Um, and, and Brian is nodding. So maybe I'm off on that. Maybe I, I'll caution saying it's not fully advertised properly. Um, and, um, Collaboration is really opt-in instead of opt-out, Like right? You have to invite people to collaborate. You have to give them permission. It's not that by default, we like open it to two people and people can come in and fix things. Um, I think that like, this is kind of still like a more revolutionary inflammatory idea where people are like, this is not a, you know, a secure software practice and stuff. But like, I, you know, I don't think tools have high security restrictions in the first place. And there are a lot of things that are like safe for people to do, you know, um, say for people to do regardless. Um, and like, you know, restarting a web server is like very simple and doesn't like it, it's, you can get wrong. You, you can, things can go wrong with that, but you know, it's, it's pretty small. Um, and like compared to Debian, which has like in Debian, anyone can really upload to any package, but there are soft, there are like rules that say like, oh, you're only supposed to touch your package unless it's in like in one of these emergency requirement type things. Um, so what is like actually nice? Like these are just me like spitballing ideas and stuff. Um, it, it really depends what, what people work on. Um, I think that compared to like a lot of internet places, tool for just like a platform that you can like genuinely improve, whether it's just through like providing feedback, filing issues, or like actually writing code. Um, and I think that like tool forge has you know, really been shaped and evolved by the people who passed through it and contributed their ideas, both good and bad. Um, and I think that like, we should not take for granted, we should not like assume that, oh, it's a static platform is being maintained by full-time staff, like they'll take care of it. Um, I think it is like, a, it, it really has to come from people who want to approve it. Um, and I fully expect to be here in 10 years giving another talk about how we made it 20 years. Like, I, I think this is a, a great project that will, you know, survive and, and evolve and thrive. Um, and yeah, um, this is uh, my my Amazon handle. Um, and then if you want to provide feedback, there's the, the cloud mailing list and like the IRC and Telegram channel. And Brian is also giving a talk at noon titled um, What's New in Cloud Services with some of like the new changes and features over the past few years and um, generously provided tool forge stickers up at the front um, if you if you want to grab some um, so I think we have uh, so thank you thank you all for coming and I think we have some time for does the grid engine transition not count as throwing it out and starting over again um Sort of, kind of, yes, but no, I would say. <laughs> it's not as big of a transition, but I, I, I don't think, I, I think it's worth not understanding. I mean, the whole infrastructure is still yeah, there, they, though. They, the, uh, the entire thing got moved. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's fair. Um, I, I think that, um, so I was expecting more like non-technical people to show up to the, <laughs> <laughs> the nuances of like sun grid engine versus open grid engine and stuff like that. Um, but like there was, you know, the, the tool server had this problem. Like I talked about, like that there was like too many people wanting to use it. And so they implemented this like 
um, scheduling system where like you submit a job and then it, you know, it, it, once there's enough resources, you, you, it runs and then you get feedback back. And it was called SunGrid Engine and it had all sorts of weird quirks and stuff. And then when Tool, when Toolforge came online, they were like, okay, like this is a paradigm people understand. We also have the same problem where we don't want people to overwhelm stuff. Like let's just use the slightly different forked version of it called Open Grid Engine. Um, and like it worked, but like basically by the time, like it was kind of dead, like the project was more or less dead. And so like, we were like actively walking into like unmaintained deprecated technology. Um, and then that required like a good, like three, four years of like struggling to like replace it to a new system and then getting everyone to migrate over to a new system that's like based on Kubernetes, which is like the new hotness and cool cloud scheduling technology. But yes, I, I think that is like an example of like one of the things that Toolforge copied from tool server and it, like it might have been the correct decision at the time i don't really know how viable it was at the time but like and and yeah and like also like you know there's already so many parts of the migration like if that would have been yet another thing to change like i don't know how well how poorly you know the migration would have gone but yeah that's a good point if, as, as a non-technical person, if, if I have like an idea for a tool, like I see, is this a, is this a good idea for a tool or is it not? Is it like super hard? Is it, is it easy? Uh, is, where, where would we be a place to discuss that? Um, yeah, so there is a fabricator project called Technical Tool Request. Um, I think that's a reasonable place. I would say that like Wikipedians don't, like non-technical Wikipedians, like, and really like no like shade intended, but like, don't understand how easy or difficult some tools are. And which is like a general problem. There's like a really great XKCD where it's like one problem is like, great, like I can do that in an hour. And the other one's like, yeah, give me a team of like 10 PhD researchers and I'll be back to you in like a decade with the solution. <laughs> <laughs> some, some problems are like very simple. Like if it's already laid out in the database, it is very simple to like generate a list of based on some certain criteria. If it's not in the database, then it might be more difficult to like scrape the data. And then there's some problems where, like we can just like, oh, it must be easy. It take me like 10 minutes to do this task. Like, like, no, like there's so many edge cases that make it very difficult. But I think uh I also think that like um just getting the idea down is good because one of the other times is like there are a lot of people who are like, oh, I know how to code. How can I help Wikipedia? And you know, it's like Technical tool requests that are well scoped are like actually a great place for that because it you know allows them to do something in like whatever framework or tool thing that they are comfortable with, um, and you know it's usually like a more small self contained project. You mentioned uh, how at least we don't have three month rep lag, but recently we had a one week rep lag and your people that you say don't know where to go for help and don't understand why there was a one week rep lag. Yeah, um, I, I think it's funny because I think this is also like another like victim of own success thing. And because like in tool forage or sorry, in tool server, rep lag was a big issue. Every tool had like bottom, I had like built in detection stuff that said like, if rep lag is more than, you know, an hour, like emit a little banner saying like, results will be out of date by this much time, right? And like, that was like a thing that basically every tool had to have, especially because if your results are gonna be based on like three month old data. Um, and then when everyone moved over to Toolforge, like existing tools that were moved over usually kept that logic in, but like I at least stripped it out from a lot of my tools because like red flag is like, it's, it's not an issue, right? And most it's like a few minutes and it, it, and it really wasn't a big problem. And like, there used to be a template on the English Wikipedia called template tool server. And there was just a bot that would update it every hour with what the current sure. was. And like bots would just embed that on their user page and like various tools would have that embedded on their user page because that way it's like when people complain about the bot, they just have a little thing that says, oh, well, rep lag is at, you know, like three days or whatever gonna complain. And like, no one has even like been like, oh, we should bring this back. Like, because tool, tool forge rep lag has been so good for most of its lifetime. And I think, yeah, like, the week is like it, it is going to be interesting to figure out whether the one week issue is like is that a was that a one off aberration or is like are we going to see that going forward as like system administrators make more database changes um and i think like tools might need to adopt and go back to the old style of like detecting if replication lag is high and and outputting a warning the reason it happens today is because we're fixing the database which is better than the reason that it used to happen was because we just had shitty transport between the databases. Yeah. So at least there is 
there's a cause now that's not just <laughs> failure. Yeah, but not just work. Gosh, I remember when the latency between the uh, on the replication database was so high, and I had to make multiple requests to multiple tables, and it just caused the tool to run for 730 seconds before it actually loaded something. I'm just like, why is it so long? And it turns out it wasn't residing on the same system, as far as I understand. So I had to fashion up some union requests. Yes, there were, there were like in the in the first few months of ToolForge, it was like split between two data centers in like the Tampa data center and the Virginia data center. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I we want to make sure people have enough time to get to their their next session. So thank thank you all for coming once again. And if you have any questions, please.